All right, we are live. Thanks, Shoki. Okay. Okay. Good evening, all students, parents, and guardians. Uh, we are waiting for a few more minutes uh, to wait for more attendees coming in. We'll be start around 3 uh, p.m. Uh, to be two minutes. We'll see how it goes, but we'll sign soon. Please wait and thank you. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this year's pre-departure briefing for Malaysian students planning on studying in the UK. Many thanks to you all for coming along this evening. I hope you are all very well. My name is Rifan Roslan. I am the Program Manager, Education and Study UK at the British Council in Malaysia. I am delighted to welcome you all in this evening sessions you are all going to embark on an exciting new chapter and we are here to support here here to support you on that journey this evening we'll be covering practical information and guidance on how to prepare for your upcoming studies and what you can expect from uk higher education at this time on our panel this evening we are pleased to be joined by his Excellency Charles Hay, British High Commissioner to Malaysia. Also, Pandora Pradit Nayana, Customer Account Manager, UK Visas and Immigration. Also, Hisham Jalori, UK alumni from University College London. Mohammed Ismat Koyum, Chairperson elect from United Kingdom and IR Council, UKEC. Also joining me and supporting me in backend is Helen Yang, Senior Marketing Manager, Study UK East Asia from the British Council, Isha Azman, Program Manager Society, and Shauki Azman, Program Programs Officer at British Council Education. Before we get started, a note on how you can interact with our panelists during this session. We want the webinar to be interactive, so do please share any questions via the Q&A box at the top right of your screen, and we will do our best to put them to the panel during the designated question and answer session at the end of, of today's webinar. Next slide, please. To begin this evening session, I am very pleased to introduce you all to His Excellency Charles Hay, British High Commissioner to Malaysia, who will provide this evening's opening address. Please welcome. 
Thank you very much, Rufan. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to come along and speak at this uh, at this event, which I think is is an extremely useful thing to do uh, for those people considering well aiming to go to the UK to study. Um, as you say, I'm Charles Say. I'm the UK High Commissioner. I've been British High Commissioner here in Malaysia for about the last 16 months, um, and. Uh, one of the real pleasures about being High Commissioner here is the fantastic educational relationship there is between Malaysia uh, and the UK at all levels. I mean, obviously here we're talking about uh, university level, but there are uh, lots of Malaysians who go to school in the UK. There are British schools here in Malaysia. Um, and of course, there are five UK universities who have campuses here in Malaysia as well. Um, but I'm very pleased that uh, there's so many people joining us this evening and that uh, and that you've chosen the UK as your study destination. Um, I think one thing that we definitely benefit from in the UK is the diversity of the students who come to us to study. When I was at university uh, some 30 odd years ago, a bit more than 30 years ago, we had very, very few uh, international students at that time. And I think students today have a much more rich and diverse educational experience. Uh, and I'm very pleased that Malaysia is, uh, so many Malaysians come to the UK to study and contribute to that rich diversity. I think it enriches the experience for all concerned, including the UK uh, and other students. And I think there's a fantastic long-term effect uh, that we see, which is that people who go to the, the UK to study, they come away with a good understanding of the UK um, and uh, long term relationships. And uh, constantly I meet people here in Malaysia who studied in the UK and developed very deep uh, affection uh, for their time in the UK and long term friendships with the UK and people in the UK. And this has been going on for a long time. Uh, I called uh, yesterday on one of my neighbours, Tunku Razali, who's now 83 years old, and he studied at Queen's University in Belfast. So people have been studying in the UK at universities for a very long time. And it's a very exciting thing to do. It's a very exciting time for you as you prepare uh, to go to study in the UK. It's a time that you won't forget. The UK, um, I'm very pleased that you've chosen the UK. Uh, I'm delighted that the UK is a popular study destination, but in a way I'm not surprised because of the quality that we provide. Now, you might think that I would say that as the British High Commissioner, and you might be right, but I think it's also true. If you look at the global university rankings, uh, the UK normally has three universities in the top 10, um, and that is quite a remarkable achievement for what for we are we you know we are not a huge country we're a relatively middle sized country and to have uh, educational establishments of such quality is um, is a wonderful thing and it's a testament to um, the I think the educational ecosystem that we built up in the UK and our graduates as a result from the UK not just from those top three but from all the other uh, universities and the rankings are a, amongst the most employable globally. I think in, at the moment amongst the top 200 universities we have something like 26 uh, institutions again which is a remarkable achievement um, and that is uh, why the UK is one of the most popular study destinations in the world. Um, at the moment of course uh, the situation is more uncertain than usual, more difficult and I want to assure you that your well-being as a student is the top priority for our educational establishment and for the UK government. So we will do everything we can to make you feel safe and secure as you meet students from every country and make those important friendships that are going to stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. So um, starting a new course, moving away from home, going to study in a different country is a can be a daunting experience. So I think this briefing session today is a great opportunity for you to put all your questions to representatives from the British Council from UK visas and immigration about some of the things you need to prepare for and some of the need, the need the things that you need to think about. And I hope that we can provide answers to you today for some of the uncertainties and questions that you may have in your minds. But I do want to assure you that 
we have been working very closely with UK university sector to make sure that they're ready to welcome new students uh, in the autumn of this year. And universities are doing things in different ways depending on their different situations. But of this uh, a recent survey we did talking to the different universities, we find that almost all of them are preparing to provide some sort of face to face teaching during even the first term of this uh, of this academic year. And of course, they're making full use of online technology and tools to make sure that um, students have the most positive and beneficial experience and to make sure that the teaching is delivered in a safe environment. And I know that one of the most important things about going away to study at university is the social and sporting and other activities. And the universities are giving a great deal of thought to how they can provide as much as they can of that in a safe way as well. So uh, they are finding ways to allow for some face to face social interactions to happen too. Um, but of course, your well-being remains the most important priority. So I want to reassure you that a very warm welcome is waiting for each and every one of them, uh, each and every one of you, uh, wherever you go to study in the UK. And I believe that the UK's open and inclusive way of life will inspire you. Uh, I hope that you will be fired up by our rich cultural history and most importantly that you get the chance to travel uh, all around the UK to see all of the wonderful things that my country has to offer you. So I wish you all the very best with your studies and I hope you enjoy and get your answers that you need from the rest of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much High Commissioner His Excellency Charles Hay. Before I start the pre-departure briefing session, I would like you to listen to a video message by uh, Michelle Donnellan, Minister of State for University United Kingdom. Please welcome the video. Please play the video. As the university's minister, I want to make a promise to our international students that we stand by you and are doing everything we can to support you. The UK has a global reputation for academic excellence and innovative teaching. With four universities in the world's top 10, the coronavirus pandemic doesn't change this. So we're working to ensure that existing processes, such as visa applications, are as flexible as possible. So the international students who've been planning to study in the UK can continue to do so. Lots of our universities have already set out their plans for the next academic year, including social distancing measures, contact tracing procedures, as well as advice on face coverings and other hygiene practices. And to keep the number of transmissions in the UK as low as possible, all international students arriving here will be required to provide contact information and some arrivals will need to self-isolate in their accommodation for 14 days. We're reviewing these measures regularly to ensure that they're in line with the latest scientific evidence and remain effective and necessary. And so I'd encourage you to check the latest travel advice before you travel. We are proud that UK universities are already ensuring that their students are safe and well cared for, both upon arrival, but also for the duration of their entire stay. Along with ministers responsible for universities in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, I've written to all international students 
to reiterate that our universities are open and that we're looking forward to welcoming you the next academic year. From summer 2021, for students who complete undergraduate or master's degrees, the UK's new graduate route will enable you to work or look for work in the UK at any skill level for two years after graduation. And this rises to three years for those who successfully complete a PhD. We've also confirmed that international students present in the UK before April 2021 will still be able to be eligible for the graduate route, even if you begin your course online before travelling to the UK in person. Because nobody should have to put their future on hold because of this virus. And I look forward to welcoming our international students because you are part of what makes our higher education sector world class. All right, we finished the video and I hope you feel assured with the message by Minister Michelle Donnellan. And now we will start the pre-departure briefing session. So before um, I start uh, on the more details about the UK, I would like to inform you that we have a student from Malaysia that just received a great scholarship um, at the Staffordshire University in MA in eSports. So um, he's one of our attendees today. So just to heads up to everyone in this uh, webinar right now that the great scholarship is an annual activity by uh, the Study UK uh, campaign. So please uh, stay tuned for the next scholarship coming ahead for 2021 um, in our Study UK platform. Next slide, please. So what we will cover today is um, a, a very uh, in-depth and detailed information about the UK and what to do before you leave your home, uh, traveling to the UK, arriving in the UK, living in the UK, and also looking after yourself, especially in this, in this condition. Next slide. The UK is uh, open and inclusive way of life that um, inspire you. It is rich with cultural history, will fire your imagination. Our universities is also, are also among the most trusted and respected in the world, and you will develop your best and brightest ideas by studying here. Next slide. The UK is home of the English language and one of the most popular study destinations for international students, home to some of the world's greatest cultural events and a place to make memories that will last a lifetime. And it is a place for you to become the best possible version of yourself. Next slide. The UK is a very tolerant country where all ways of life are expected. In fact, it is against the law to discriminate against anyone because of their race, nationality or religion with a history of multi multiculturalism dating back hundreds of years, the UK has well established communities representing all students and a deep commitment to supporting students, religious and cultural needs on campus. One of the reasons international students feel especially at home in the UK is the diversity of our universities. 20% of academic staff in the UK are from overseas, meaning you will be connecting with people from all over the world, no matter what you choose to study. Next slide. Here we recover, prepare to study and live online course by the Study UK, information from your UK university or institution, a checklist of things to arrange before you arrive in the UK. Next slide. The Prepare to Study and Live in the UK online course. It is hosted um, It is hosted on the Future Learn online course platform. It is a MOOC. This four week online course will teach students everything they need to know about UK higher education, including teaching methods, course structures, and how coursework will be assessed. It will also provide with the tips for studying in the English language and practical information about living in the UK. By completing this course, you will be more confident, feel prepared and get the most experience of studying and living in the UK. During the course, there will also be plenty of opportunities for 
uh, you to interact with other like-minded individuals who are also preparing for UK education. Who knows, they may even start making friends. You may even start making friends before you arrive in the UK because this will be an open course. Hence, it will be uh, there will be live webinar and open courses for all students. Next slide. Your place of study or work should have sent you information. Please read this carefully. We recommend that you start making presentation as soon as you can. It may include information on practical skills, academic matters, language and cultural preparation, arrival in the UK, as well as advice on immigration and managing your money, health and guidance for students with disabilities. You will be given deadlines for confirming services such as accommodation, meet and greet, orientation briefings, and emergency numbers to use should you require assistance on your journey to the UK. So please contact your universities or institutions. Next slide, please. Here is a checklist of things to arrange before you leave your home country. In terms of accommodation, please ensure that you have your onward address written down as you will need this to show this at the border to demonstrate where you will be staying for your 14 days self isolation. I will explain to you furthermore about this 14 days uh, quarantine when and in relation to your university after this presentation. In terms of travel insurance, you should take out travel insurance to cover your journey to the UK. This will cover you in case of any medical emergencies for loss of baggages or even flight delays and cancellations. For medical insurance, uh, when you pay the immigration health surcharge as part of your visa, you are entitled to free NHS treatment. If you are coming to the UK for less than six months or on a visitor visa, you do not have the option of applying for this and are required and you are required to take out adequate travel or medical insurance for duration of your stays. In all, in summary, the, the immigration health surcharge is only for tier four students, uh, international students. Your university should have sent you information about arrival, including a phone, phone number for support. Keep this number with you uh, when you travel and check to make sure you have this. If you can't find uh, your contact for your institution, um, this will seem obvious, but make sure you know the address of where you need to get to. Print or write down this. Uh, don't rely on your phone uh, for essential information like this. So please write it down. Next slide. Traveling to the UK. In this section, we'll cover in terms of what to pack and what to carry and what not to carry in your luggage. Next slide. To ensure you have suitable clothing for the season, uh, in terms of autumn, from, uh, in terms of winter especially, um, the average temperature is around two to seven and the coldest can be below zero. So you need to find a really suitable uh, attire for this. And, and summer will be around nine to 18 degrees, but at hottest can be up to 13 degrees. So you may need a variation uh, of options in terms of your clothing uh, for all these seasons. So just an important note that you may also want to bring along uh, a traditional wear, um, a traditional wear from Malaysia, because sometimes um, societies might might host, or even university might host, uh, cultural nights, uh, international students' nights, where you you would want to wear this kind of um, attires to re reflect and represent your cultural diversity, uh, especially uh, in Malaysia, where we are all uh, multi multi cultural um, diversity countries. So next slide. And before uh, before this slide, I would like just to highlight that please uh, for winter attire, please uh, try to avoid it and and as it will take too much room in your luggage and you may buy it in the UK. You, you will have much more options in terms of pricing and selections. OK, in terms of what to pack in your carry on luggage, um, you need to have, of course, please don't forget your valid passport and visa, uh, your travel ticket and departure details, um, your offer letter from universities, your CAS, confirmation for your accommodation, at least on your first night in the UK. But in this case of COVID-19, you may need to confirm also your 14 days 
of stays uh, information, the address of it. Uh, confirmation of your medical insurance in case, uh, copies of your bank draft information, correct details for your universities or information, information about your airport uh, pickup inf information if required. And of course, a pound, pound uh, sterling money to cover your immediate needs uh, in case you are not able to withdraw yet uh, in case uh, your bank account in the UK has not been set up. So it's good to have a, a, a small amounts of cash uh, when you arrive in the UK. And it is also always a good idea to save your um, digital copies of any important, of any important documents to your email or cloud storage. And in addition, please have a contact for uh, your own embassy in, in London just in case you need it. But for our case, it's Malaysian embassy. So please have a contact uh, details of them in case you need it. Next slide. In terms of what not to pack in your luggage, make sure you do not pack any of the following items. Uh, this include banned and restricted items like drugs, weapons, indecent and obscene materials, even paper spray and counterfeit goods. Restricted foods, uh, raw foods, uh, meat, uh, dairy products, all meat and dairy uh, and potatoes, fruits, vegetables. So anything that's quite raw, please do not bring this along in your luggage or you will uh, have difficulties entering the UK. Next slide, please. In this section about when you arrive in the UK, you, we will cover the registering your stay and settling and adjusting to UK life. Next slide. Self-isolation and guidance. Check whether your country is on the gov.uk list. In our case, Malaysia is uh, in the list. Hence, we any, any uh, citizens from Malaysia or any UK citizens from Malaysia, anyone from Malaysia entering the UK will need to be self-quarantined for 14 days. Hence, it is important to keep uh, numbers of transmission in the UK as low as possible. Um, uh, please isolate yourself within uh, the compound of the universities and please contact your universities for more information about your accommodation uh, self-isolation. A large number of students will be required to self-isolate for 14 days and, and as I mentioned just now, people who arrive in England or in the UK will, after 10th of July, um, will not have to self-isolate if they are well uh, and have to come to uh, to see if they are you are exempted or not. In summary, you will have to provide your journey and contact details on an online form 48 hours or less before you travel to the UK. You will not be allowed to leave the place where you are staying in the UK for your first 14 days of quarantine, except in li very limited situations. This means that if you intended to come to the UK for study, you must take into account these extra days of not being able to attend face-to-face -face class, see other people or leave your accommodation, except for very limited reasons. There is no end date yet for these measures, but it is very important that you contact your education provider before you decide to travel to the UK. This is so that you can check what support you will receive during these first 14 days, including accommodation, food, online facilities for induction, orientation, meeting tutors, and other students and many other matters. University colleges and schools are in the process of thinking about how best they can help you during this time, and it is vital that they know what you plan to do and where you will be staying. Next slide, please. Registering your stay, biometric residence permit, your visa will be issued for a period of 30 days, 30 days, which provide you with time to travel to the UK. And then you must collect your biometric residence permit, which, contain, which contains your permission to stay longer. If you are having, if you are having to self-isolate, you won't be penalized for being unable to collect your BRP card within 10 days. Once you have finished uh, your isolation, please do collect your BRP card. Next slide. In this section, we'll cover accommodation, money managing, uh, money or managing your finances, culture, uh, food and drinks. Next slide. Don't panic 
uh, please don't panic in terms of accommodation. Temporary accommodation is a good option for your first couple of days if you haven't secured anything longer term before coming to the UK. Think about your requirements and needs before deciding on what type of accommodations to choose. Universities do provide secure accommodation, but there are other options available. Consider location, consider the location as accommodation may be cheaper because it's further away, but you will then have travel costs. Check carefully any terms and conditions in the accommodation contract and ensure it covers the length of your time in the UK before you sign. Hence, in summary, please do contact your university institution to get more information about their self isolation facilities. Next slide. Managing your finances. Make sure you bring enough money to tie your, you over the first few days while you wait for your bank account to open, as I mentioned just now. Next slide, please. Managing in terms of uh, living costs, please take note that it is vary according to the type of accommodation on where you are traveling and where you will be studying. Uh, it also depends on whether you are living in the cities or suburbs or uh, or in in a more outskirt uh, of London. So that's these are all very important um, variables that will impact your your costing to live in the UK. It is important that you have a realistic idea of where you live and before you arrive in the UK. So um, we will have an alumni joining us today. Um, he will be able to provide you, provide you with more information about this. Next slide. Studying in the UK is a good value for money and average living costs here are lower than in both USA and Australia. You can expect to pay between 800 pounds to uh, 103,000 uh, pounds a month to cover your rent, bills, food and other living costs. Um, from 10 pounds a month for a mobile phone contract, SIM card only. Uh, contracts which includes handsets will cost more. So you and you can also buy a pay as you go SIM card and add credit when you need to. Um, for your information, a cup of coffee costs you around 2.4 pounds from a high street cafe and around 40 pounds a month for a monthly gym membership. This and other costs will differ depending on where you live and study in the UK, um, with London and other major cities being more expensive. Keep that in mind. Please keep that in mind. Uh, next slide. The UK Council for International Students Affairs or UK CISA um, uh, they have a website where you are able to calculate the cost of living and also have a, a money saving tips. I repeat again, UK CISA, please Google uh, this website. It is a UK Council for International Students Affairs. Um, please take note and visit this website to get more uh, information about costing living in the UK. There are a lot of discount and voucher websites which promote current deals for shops, restaurants and activities. You can register on these websites to receive regular emails with updated offers and download the apps. Some of national offers and you can also input your location to receive information on offers for your local area. Some examples are Groupon, Living Social, Voucher and vouchercodes.co.uk. There are other uh, that you can search online. If you do use any of these sites, please read the terms and conditions carefully. Next slide. In terms of culture and leisure, students' unions organize all kinds of social functions. And to add, especially to this uh, slide on this part, um, we're going to have uh, 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 students currently studying in the UK and representing one of the biggest society, Malaysian society in the UK called UKEC. He will uh, go in depth in more details about this part. But take note that um, please keep in mind that um, UK is a, is a very um, multicultural and international uh, experience you will have in the UK. Next slide. In terms of food and drinks, you can find all kinds of international foods and cuisines in the UK with a large array of different restaurants, um, supermarkets and specialty food, um, shops stock a range of international foods, including halal and non-halal, 
um, if you're looking for Chinese food, it is not difficult to find. It's everywhere in the UK. But take note that to drink a call in the UK, you must be over the age of 18 years old. All pubs and bars and restaurants offer a wide range of non-alcoholic non -alcoholic drinks too. Um, next slide, please. Starting in the UK in 2020, we will cover in terms of creating a safe environment, blended learning, and also student well-being. Next slide. All UK universities are working very hard and following government guidance to be ready to welcome students in 2020. It's evolving and changing all the time, that's for sure, but with each of the four UK countries taking their own approach to reopening um, up the country after lockdown. Information and guidance will vary across England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Please visit the following links in the slide. As a, uh, please visit the following links in the slide. The UK universities are preparing to welcome new students in autumn 2020 with one of the best healthcare systems in the world, globally respected policing and low crime rates. Studying in the UK is exceptionally safe and secure at a time of economic uncertainty and change. Studying is a great option to use the time effectively and prepare for more stable times. You can develop your skills and knowledge and make sure, make sure yourself more employable. Many UK universities are going above and beyond to ensure that um, students physical and mental health and well-being are prioritized so you will be able to so you will be well looked after in the UK. Next slide. Almost all universities, 97% according to UUKI are preparing to deliver some in-person teaching this autumn. So meaning that majority of universities in the UK are preparing to deliver um, uh, uh, capacity uh, to deliver face-to-face -face teaching, but some will be face-to-face -face learning with online technology and tools to support student education and ensure teaching is delivered in a safe environment. In many cases, there will be online lectures for students and campus and those working remotely. Where safe to do so, the university, uh, UK universities are practicing bubbles. They call it bubbles, a mechanism that brings same group all together. For example, if you are from engineering students, you are only allowed to mingle with engineering students and you will you will be uh, grouped together uh, in smaller groups that will allow you to to attend tutorials, classes face to face, um, but you are not allowed. <coughs> excuse me. You are not allowed to mingle with other faculties. That's why they call it bubbles. Uh, this is a mechanism to control physical distancing or in Malaysia we call it social distancing. There are some exciting and innovative examples of high quality online learning being delivered by institutions across the UK. If you have any questions about your course, please contact your chosen or prospective universities directly. Most institutions aim to hold face to face in small groups, as I mentioned. This means that a small, uh, there's the same group of students will be taught together in this autumn term. Um, and this mix of formats, we call it just now blended learning. The UK government has confirmed that it will allow tier four sponsor students um, to, it will allow tier four sponsors to sponsor international students for blended learning for 2020, uh, 2021 academic year. For more information, please check your institution websites. Please do contact them. Next slide. Timing of teaching is also uh, being carefully considered to make a uh, maximum of teaching days with flexible timetabling to avoid having too many students on campus at the same time. The health and well-being of international students is our number one priority and UK universities are working to ensure that they are safe and supported. UK universities are going above and beyond to ensure students' physical and mental health well-being are prioritized. Universities have already implemented a number of COVID-19 support services that are current and future international students can access. Some measures include helplines for 24-7, free accommodation for those in need, and facilitating free counseling and mental health support services. Ukraine universities are keen to support student mental and well-being during the pandemic with many putting initiatives in place which support students to keep active and socialize centrally. Next slide. 
International students will always be able to access treatment that clinicians consider immediately necessary or urgent at no upfront cost. The NHS can also provide international students with specific COVID-19 advice through new COVID-19 online service in or by calling 9111 or by logging into www.111.nhs.co.uk slash COVID-19. No charges apply to testing for coronavirus even though it is negative or any treatment provided in relation to coronavirus. Next slide. The NHS uh, will ensure uh, your health, but keep in mind that there are other charges that are chargeable. This include medicines, eye tests, dental care, vaccinations. Next slide. When registering with your GP or doctor, please take your passport to identification, proof of address or photograph with you. Uh, for NHS dentists, uh, it will be difficult for you to register um, as they usually have a full patient list. You, might, you may have to register on a waiting list for a period of time, but refer to your GP uh, or NHS dentist on a request. In each UK countries, England, Scotland or Wales, and Northern Ireland, the NHS service may slightly be different. For example, the cost of prescriptions. So please check their website for more information. Next slide. Your personal safety is our concerns. So the UK is very is doing their their very best to ensure that uh, the UK is safe. Uh, it is a low uh, level of crimes and violence. Staff at George universities will help you with any concerns. You must also make sure you attend the orientation course at your universities for more information about uh, keeping you safe. Next slide. Please retain a copy of your embassy contact number, as I mentioned just now, just in case it may also be worth registering with them in case you have an emergency in relation to your passport or visas. Next slide. If you're experiencing if you are experiencing stress which affecting your well-being, please contact your tutor or supervisor or university welfare services in the first instance and notify your UK award administrator. Many institutions have their, their security staff which carry an overnight responsibility for coordinating urgent responses to crisis situations. So informal support and students union, social club, international societies, um, these are all kind of services that are available to you. Please, places of worship, in terms of places of worship, you can um, have access to it uh, in your universities on, or in your town. Uh, and please take note that there are also this uh, call, the Samaritan's helpline, which offer you a 24 hours listening service and offer an email response. Next slide. In our next session, I would like to invite you uh, I just finished my pre-departure briefing and we will proceed with our next session. Uh, hence, I would like to invite uh, Muhammad Ismat Khoyum. He is the chairperson uh, elect of the UK, United Kingdom and Ayer Council, UKEC, who will share information about his experience in participating in society as a Malaysian student in the UK. Now, please welcome Ismat. Hi guys. Hi guys. Um, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, could we get up my slides, please? Cool. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ismat, uh, and I'm the current chairperson elect of UKC 2020. And before I begin, I actually just want to confirm that coffee is indeed 2.3 pounds. However, you might find it a bit more expensive in London. Uh, as you know, London is quite expensive. Uh, I know firsthand as I'm actually a student at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, I have just finished my second year and I read philosophy, politics and economics. And today I'm going to be doing essentially an introduction to the student society life and in particular give you also an introduction to UKC uh, as a tangent to that. So let's begin. So 
in terms of UKC specifically, we're essentially an umbrella body that connects all the Malaysian societies in the UK and Ireland and that's approximately 80 Malaysian societies. And essentially we try to do a lot of different things, but the main thing is being an organization for nation building. And this can be in, in a lot of different ways, community development, tackling brain drain, developing employability, strengthening mutiny, unity, and providing a platform for nonpartisan intellectual discourse. But you know, all those are just quite really big words to really say one thing that UKC is an organization to really serve the Malaysian community in the UK and Ireland. And so we'll be exploring a bit of what we do specifically in the following slides. So in terms of a brief history of UKC, um, UKC was founded in 1995 by Adlan Ben Omar, who was a Cambridge history and politics student. And what his vision was, was creating a Malaysian organization that was strictly nonpartisan. At the time, there were many party and politically affiliated organizations. And so there was really a demand for an organization that didn't tend or cater to one side of the political divide. And this was really UKC's first starting point in 1995. Over the years, in the past you know, quarter of a century already, UKC has developed and grown from what was just a few members to now representing over 16,000 Malaysian students. So it's fair to say that the it's been a good 25 years and hopefully we can get another 25 more. So that's the brief history of UKC. In terms of the team, uh, I can assure you we don't always look like this. If you, you can even find me somewhere there. But UKC is split up into the Executive Council and the Supreme Council. The Executive Councils are members who apply directly to UKC to help the internals of UKC, whereas the Supreme Councils are really the presidents and vice presidents of every single Malaysian uh, society across the UK and Ireland. So if you happen to become elected, for example, as the LSE and Malaysian Society president, you will automatically be put into the Supreme Council. And so that's really a brief summary of how UKC is structured uh, currently. A little so that on to the next slide, which should talk about the Supreme Councillors. So I think this is a good point to actually segue uh, into more about the general landscape of society life in the UK and Ireland. Whilst you can definitely, and I recommend this, I really do encourage everyone to be an active member in their Malaysian societies, you do should everyone should take note that there's a lot of other societies that you can be a part of in your, your respective universities. For, I can talk about my own past experiences before I even joined UKC. I was part of the consultancy society. I helped out in some NGOs such as Blue Dragon, which helps out with human trafficking in uh, for in Vietnam to things like being a student volunteer ambassador for the LSE Volunteer Center. And so that's just LSE. I'm sure other universities that you all uh, have offers to go to, they will have so many, a myriad of different societies. And I really do encourage that everyone takes that opportunity because these are really things that you can't get anywhere else. And it would be a shame to leave university if the only thing that uh, some of you only do is just uh, participating in the Malaysian society. There's benefits definitely in doing that, but I do encourage, you know, push your interests, push your boundaries, join sports events, join the media, go to a theatre trip if you're down in London. And so really take the time to explore those things. Um, yeah, but also definitely do uh, participate in the Malaysian society. It's definitely very important. Uh, on to the next slide. Okay, so we're, I'll try to breeze through this. This is really just a bit more about what UKEC does specifically, if anyone's actually interested thus far. And one of the great things that we do is this very prestigious event. I think it's the 17th year in existence now. It's called Project Amanat Nagara. And it's really a platform for intellectual discourse. We invite academics, intellectuals from Malaysia and even uh, uh, people in the UK to really speak about some of the most pertinent issues that Malaysia is facing 
on both the political, social and socioeconomic levels. And so you might even be able to recognize some of these faces here. Um, just in the middle, you can see uh, Dr. Nazir Razak, who's the ex uh, CEO and chairman of CIMB. So really, it's a great event uh, that we invite all types of every Malaysian student to come down and really engage with you know, the leaders in our corporate fields and our politics today. So that's Project Aman and Negara. That's one of our flagship events in terms of the others. This is really um, one of UK's biggest events, and it's a it's a collaboration with Graduan. It's called the Malaysian Career Fair, and it's absolutely massive. And this is something I definitely encourage every student to really take advantage of because it's where we invite about 50 local Malaysian companies to come down to London. And you can see CIMB, the likes of CIMB, Maybank, Samsung, PwC, they all come down and it's a great way to actually get internships. So if you're interested uh, to really deepen and strengthen your CVs, I do recommend as a Malaysian student going to the UK to come down to London and come to the career fair. It's a great way to get that first year internship under your belt and get a lot of, a lot of I guess, leading expertise and uh, experience, which you can't really get in the UK immediately because this is one of the things in the UK is that you don't actually can get a, a, a pub private sector internship in your first year. So what's a good way that most Malaysian students do is they come down to the career fair, they try to get a great uh, prestigious internship for their first year to really beef up their CV and hopefully take that to the uh, take them forward to the second year and try to get one of these other more British uh, private sector internships. So this is a really great event that I do encourage everyone to come down to. So that's a graduate Malaysian career fair. One of our other flagship events is, um, I think it's just waiting for this last to move. Um, oh yeah, just quickly, in terms of Malaysian career fair, as you know, because of COVID, we weren't actually able to host it physically this year. Usually we host it in the Royal Lancaster uh, Hotel in London, but due to circumstances, we actually have it virtual. So I do encourage everyone to, if they have the time to visit our website and engage with Graduan who have a lot of different uh, webinars and engagement sessions with different uh, stakeholders and Malaysian companies. So that's the virtual career fair. And next slide. This is another one of our flagship events. Yes, we uh, we do a fair amount. Um, this is the Malaysian Student Leaders Summit, and what this emphasizes is really the leaders of Malaysia. And you know, I don't have to really say much in terms of the figures on the screen. You can see Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim, Tun Daim, Tun Dr. Mahadev, YB Said Sadiq. You know, all these different figures come down, and this is actually hosted in Malaysia. Uh, Again, in one of the next slides, we'll discuss it, but uh, MSLS this year is not actually physical anymore. It's virtual. So that will be detailed in the next slides. Yeah, so this is something I definitely encourage also everyone to partake in. It's a good way to interact with your, um, you know, your future leaders and your current leaders, actually. Uh, UKC has actually just recently announced the, that the opening keynote is Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim. So, even though this is on a virtual platform, it's a good way to interact with the leader of the opposition in Malaysia's current political climate. So that's uh, MSLS 2020. We can actually skip the next two slides, if that's okay, the next slide. Yeah, we can skip that slide, yeah. Oh, could we go one slide back before this one? Sorry about that. Okay, not, not sure. Okay. I think um, I'll just discuss something. I, uh, the slide's not currently on here, but it's about UKC's role in actually COVID-19 
And I think this is where I want to highlight something very significant for every single Malaysian student here is that as soon as you land in the UK, one thing I recommend for all Malaysian students is to register with Education Malaysia London. This is a great point in terms of ensuring the government knows about where your whereabouts are and can you know make sure that you're safe. And I guess there's no more fitting time than this year, especially when the COVID situation came about, UKC, Education Malaysia and the High Commissioner, we were working all together, ensuring that the Malaysian student safety is our utmost priority and that we can ensure as many students can go back to the UK, uh, go back home to Malaysia. And this was really a very critical time. We did a lot of different um, fundraisers, for example, because prices skyrocketed to £1,000 just for a one-way flight. We did a, a fundraiser. Uh, we we actually raised £8,000 and we distributed to those most in need who, so that they can go back. And so this is where UKC shows a lot of its value in terms of acting as a, as a link between you, our future Malaysian students in the UK, and the embassy and education Malaysia. So one thing I definitely recommend is uh, once you, once even now, if you have the time, do register with Education Malaysia London. It's very important, especially in uncertain times that we are all in right now. And so, if we can go to the final slide. Cool. Um, I think my final word of advice would be to actually echo His Excellency, the, uh, the High Commissioner uh, Charles Hay. His words on, he touched on the fact that in his university days, it wasn't, there weren't many international students. But what I can reassure him and both uh, and you is that that's no longer the case. I mean, for one, I go to the London School of Economics and we're actually one of the most diverse, actually the most diverse British University in terms of the amount of nationalities, the number of students from different nationalities that come down to the LSE. And that's not just unique to the LSE, that's that's in every single university. You'll be making friends both with the British, but you'll be making friends from the Middle East, to Africa, to the States, to Australia. And I think my final piece of advice would be make the most of it in terms of that. Build up your connections, make lifelong friends that aren't necessarily just Malaysian, but all over the world, because this is not something that you can really experience again. At least that's what my what all my, my grandfather tells me and a lot of old people tell me is that university is a very unique time in your life and it's very it's a very important time in your life. And I think one of the best things you can do is try to make as many friends as possible and try to have a very diverse and enriching experience. So yeah, thank you very much and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you Ismat. And now I would like to invite Hisham Dalori uh, from University College London. He's an alumni from uh, University College London and he will share his thoughts and information of his experience on studying, living and working in the UK. Please welcome Hisham. All right. Um, good afternoon. I think um, it's in morning in the UK right now for you. Good morning. How's the weather there? <laughs> Is it? Uh, I'm actually in Malaysia at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear that, mate. Um, I think it's summer right now, right? It's summer break. Is it not? It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's holiday. Oh, right? that's lovely. My favorite season of all four <laughs> will be the summer one. Um, can I get my slide on, please? Uh, that would be great. I think I'm just going to go um, very briefly. Um, I don't have a lot of experience um, per se to begin with. That was like five or six years ago when I was studying in the UK. Um, um, I did a lot of things when I was studying in the UK. Um, I joined a lot of clubs. Uh, I did a lot of part times. Um, and, you know, I, I gained a lot of um, networks. Uh, I gained a lot of experience throughout the four years. Uh, when I study in the UCL. 
So um, before I go any further, um, and then to share my experience when I was there, I just want to share who is this guy you are seeing right now on the screen. Um, very briefly, I did my IB diploma program in Malaysia. Right after that, um, I went to UCL for about four years from 2015 to Oh, sorry, from 2011 to 2015, uh, I did my mas master's degree in electrical and electronics, but I was majoring in nanotechnology and, uh, and economics. Um, right after graduation, I landed a job with Petronas from 2015 to 2018. So I was, the, I was the one of many that handled the first floating LNG in the world, and they sent me over to Korea. Um, to commission the second LNG in the world. And after three years spending my time with Petronas, I landed a job with ExxonMobil in Singapore. And right now I am handling the first butyl plant in Asia. You know, it's a lot, a lot of things right there. You know, I mean, I've been working here and there, but above all, uh, I'm basically a full time husband to my lovely wife <laughs> and also a daddy to my little flower. Uh, so it's been really hard right now because of the COVID situation. Um, it's been five years since I saw my daughter last. Um, so hopefully this COVID will go away and I can see my daughter soon. I wanted to show you my pictures, but it seems like there's no slide on the screen right now. Um, um, just... Sorry, Chef, we, we have a, a technical uh, glitch. The slides crash, so our colleague oh, Sharky is trying cover it right okay do you mind me if i share my screen instead are we yeah yeah you're you you can do that right okay give me a minute here yeah. But just let me know when you can see my screen. That'd be great. Is it all right? Can you all see my screen? Fantastic. So, right, I wanted to show you guys the picture of me with the founder of UCL. Um, that is me like five years ago, uh, right after the graduation in 2015. Um, so again, I was majoring in electrical electronic, but I did my research on nanotechnology and in fact, I did, I did, I was the first one who broke through the graphene research in the UK. Um, so the first picture there, um, when I stood up um, in front of the Roberts building, that is the famous UCL engineering building uh, in London, uh, where you can actually see all the history where, you know, Albert and uh, Graham Bell first developed the telephone and a lot more scientists there. And also, if you have, if you happen to have a chance to go to London, this is where um, Tory, Darwin Tory was developed as well in that particular building. And the second picture was when I was offshore for about three months when I was handling the first floating uh, LNG in the world. So I spent my whole entire three months there just to make sure that um, this project uh, executed properly. And the last picture, was I was sent to Korea uh, for a couple of months to support the commissioning of the LNG. So I'm going to go and proceed with how does it feel to study in London? I don't have any experience, you know, um, studying outside of London, um, but I do have certain experience, a very little experience that the one that I've got from my friends. Uh, but I'm going to be focusing more on how does it feel when you go to London and, you know, study there um, and I'm going to break this into four different sections um, living working other opportunities and also studying in terms of the living um, in terms of food you don't have to worry too much you know you can eat as much as you can there's a lot of food there you can actually taste from Middle East from Italian food a lot of things that you can you can actually try out there and I love Italian food so don't worry about food and I think if you're able to find um, certain specific places in London 
you can get it very, very cheap as well. So you don't have to pay for $10 for a plate of rice. You can actually get it. As far as my memory serves me right, you can actually get it for $2. You just have to know the trick and the location. So this is where you have to, you know, broaden the horizon and try to have a very good networking with the locals that will help you to find these places. Um, and also, um, London, I think someone mentioned this one uh, before. London is basically segregated in four, in six different zones. Um, the further the zone from the city, the cheaper the cost uh, in terms of your accommodation rental. Uh, but in my case, I was living in zone one and zone two because one, um, I was doing my part time job in zone one. It's basically behind the Knife Bridge, behind the Imperial College. And also, it's very close to my uh, university. But bear in mind that whenever you are staying in zone one and or zone two, the rental is going to be a little bit expensive in comparison to zone three, four, and or five. And also, uh, if you're staying in zone three, four, or five, you have to commute a little bit longer uh, on tubes. So you might want to take a note on that one as well. Uh, in terms of the weather, uh, it is absolutely fantastic and summer is my best. Uh, I don't like winter because of, you know, it's very short um, days and then you have to wear a lot of thick clothes. And but you can actually feel the experience. You 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 are not going to get that um, very often. So whenever you are there, try to experience these four seasons whenever you could. Um, in terms of working, I did a lot of part time jobs uh, over the weekend. I'm not sure about the requirement right now. But uh, when I was in London, I basically used student visa to apply for my part time job. And if I'm not mistaken, I can actually use up that visa up to 20 hours in a week. So I did my part time job as a butler uh, behind the Imperial College uh, and I did that for three years. Um, every month I managed to save up about a thousand uh, pounds. So based through, through my part time job and also if you're interested to, you know, venture more into looking some part time, uh, you can actually try and ask the uni halls. Normally during summer part time, they will open the summer, uh, they will open the hall to international students to come and learn uh, summer course. So this is when university will basically advertise the um, the job to student if they are interested to be, you know, some like cleaners or receptionists. And the pay was not that bad though, I would say, because um, even though you are doing like five, five days a week and you can at least have two days off in a week, but the pay was really good. I think I was getting about $600 a month from my summer part time. So if you're, if you are having a bit of constraint in terms of the, you know, money or capital, you might want to consider this as well. And a lot of my friends, they, they did Uniqlo or H&M uh, summer part time as well as a sales assistant in London. And you because we did A level before as well, so you might want to consider tutoring for A level students and the pay is it's all right, I would say. Um, moving on to other opportunities, so bear in mind that uh, your three or four years in, in the UK, try to make full use of that by, you know, venturing yourself in a lot of other possibilities that you cannot imagine. So I did a lot of uh, volunteering. Uh, I went to Africa for seven days for humanitarian aid, and I participated in sovereign nation debate in Arizona, USA. So all of these things you can actually um, experience and you can, you know, push the door through the club that you have at, use, uh, at your unis. So don't be ashamed to participate in those kind of clubs and those kind of events because whenever you go there, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, most often than not, you can at least broaden your, your networks. And I, have, I still have a lot of friends working in Silicon Valley right now, and we are still in contact. So, and again, you never know what's going to happen. Take chances and just enjoy the process. Apart from volunteering, I did travel to a lot of places as well. And if you are studying in, in, in London, you can actually travel across Europe via single train ticket. I'm not sure whether this one is still applicable or not, but during my time, uh, we were using this single train ticket. I think I was paying about 300, 300 pounds uh, for this ticket. And we basically travel many countries in the Europe using trains. 
so you might want to travel that uh, and use use that opportunity. Uh, I think Koyu mentioned as well uh, just now. There are a lot of clubs that you can actually participate, like um, hiking clubs, you know, UN club, UKEC. Even uh, the intent is basically to uh, try to gain as much as experience whilst you know studying. Don't don't be so caught up with you know going to library, do a lot of research. We have to be able to balance that because we only live once, right? So you got to be able to experience as much as you can. So I put studying at the last because I'm not very much of a student. I put it that way. Uh, but in terms of my experience studying in, in, in London, particularly for UCL, I would say um, most of the unis uh, in London, they are SM oriented. Um, so it's quite different than the rest of the world, but you can still score that by, you know, having 20% of your coursework and do your summer exam well as well. So I think that should be OK for Malaysian students because we are known to be doing quite well in that sense. Uh, and also we do have some flexibility in, in, in uh, at unis because I did not pursue my engineering courses throughout the four years. What I did was basically um, during my third and final year, I changed my course from engineering uh, and I did take corporate finance and fraud and even accounting so that I can actually uh, expand my skills and got more of a letter in terms of, you know, job placements. So you have that flexibility to try new courses that you never tried before. So in that sense, you can actually uh, improve your knowledge and you can use that letter whenever it comes to um, pursuing the career. How does it feel to study in London? It was great. You know, I the first picture basically um, that was me featuring the cover of the Malaysian student in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it says there from volunteering in Bant in Banting to helping flood victims in the Philippines to helping children in Sudan. Uh, so. I was born in Felda, so that doesn't mean that I cannot do anything, right? So whenever you are there, try to gain as many experience as possible. So the second picture when I was doing the butler job for three years, I managed to save up up to thousand pounds per month. Uh, this is basically behind the UCI. So if you happen to study uh, and to pursue your study at Imperial College, try to find the Kingston House South. I'm still in contact with the manager, David. And the third picture was when I was in the Arizona that was uh, behind the Grand Canyon when I participated in the US sovereign nation debate. Um, left bottom one was the Manchester, if you're not mistaken, when I joined the hiking club, UCL hiking club. So we went to Manchester to hiking the one of the one of the um, mountains there. So I did travel as well. I did join a lot of activities in the UK, like marathon, 10 kilometers. It's basically for charity. And, and the, the picture in the middle was uh, the picture. I think that was in this in Sudan uh, when I was in Africa. So all in all, I, I would say it was pretty good though to study in London. You can experience a lot of things. So my last word for new students coming to the UK or even London. I always emphasize this in my in my in myself. You know, every journey begins with a single step. You do not have to push. You do not have to worry so much in the present. The only thing that you have to worry is you have to enjoy yourself. So while enjoying the experience, try to gain as many friends as possible try to develop as many skills as possible and try to network as many uh, as many networks as possible because you never know what's going to happen later on. You never know what's going to happen in the next one minute. The only thing that you can control right now is the presence. And while doing that, have patience. You know, do not rush because we, all of us have 24 hours in a day. Do not rush. Plan your day and control yourself. So I love the quotation because it helps me to go through, you know, my uni years, my work life and everything. So the picture that you are seeing right now, um, the left one is when all of us, the uh, electrical electronics student class of 2015 graduated. Um, and then this is the main gate of UCL. 
Um, so we were throwing tropes all the way to the air just to make sure that you know we enjoy ourselves. And also the second picture is the Malaysian student at UCL that the electrical electronic. There were only five of us at that particular year. That was six years ago when we did our when we finished our third year presentation. Yeah, I would say um, just enjoy the experience in the UK because not everybody has that kind of experience as, as you do. Thank you. Thank you, Hisham, for your um, very, very useful information and experience sharing uh, in the UK. Now I would like to invite um, Pandora from UK Visas and Immigration to uh, share the latest updates regarding visas and immigration. I'm sure you all are waiting for this. Please uh, welcome Pandora. Hello everyone, it's so good to have you all online. This is how we're studying and living and working these days. Um, I'm sure you're all really pro at this by now. So um, I work for UK Visas and Immigration. Um, I'm here uh, to help um, you demystify what does a UK a student visa looks for you at this time and what the processes are so you may successfully apply for it and get it right and feel confident when you do so. So uh, let's start the presentation, shall we? Thank you. So um, next slide, please. We'll go straight to it. We're diving right into the deep here. Um, so Malaysian nationals, um, you are what we call as Appendix H nationals. This means you're very, very fortunate to have uh, the opportunity to submit lesser documents with your UK student application. Um, so uh, practically, if you see uh, the icons on the screen, this is all you have to um, prepare in terms of proof when you submit your application online. So of course you need your passport. Now there's a lot of queries about how long the duration should be for your passport, for your validity. So say it's going to expire before six months and your course is longer than that. It may be a year, two years, four years. Um, you don't need to renew your passport yet. I always say get your visa in first, stick it in the passport and then get your new passport and travel with those two passports, OK? Um, so you don't need that. But to fly, your airlines might need a valid visa for about six months minimum. OK, you also need your CAS. Now, this is uh, given to you by your university. When you get it, the time really varies from university to university. Um, this is received after you get your LOA. So you can apply for your UK visa as soon as you get your CAS in hand. You'll also need an ATA certificate only if for courses that your university set that you need one. So if you're not instructed to get an ATA certificate, you don't need to worry about that. Now for Malaysian nationals who have uh, lived in Malaysia for the last six months, you do need a TB test. Now this can't be at any random TB test centre, any hospital that you choose. You do have to go to the gov.uk website. Um, it's on the tier four general visa link at the bottom there to see which test centres are um, applied by UKVI um, that you can do that, okay? Um, so for those of you who are bringing dependents, say you're bringing your uh, husband, wife or children, if you apply on the same day, um, so you apply as in you submit biometrics at the appointment of your choice at the same time with your family, then you don't need to provide a full set of documents like uh, funds, uh, marriage certificate, etc. Um, you just need to provide the TB test, the passport and um, just uh, the CAS from the um, main applicant. Um, but if your family applies in a different time, you want to bring them later on in the year or next year, they can also do that, but they need to provide the full set of documents. So your funds, etc. you will also need to submit with their application when they apply then in the future. All right. Um, so let's see what else. Um, the documents, they can just be screenshots from your phone. They don't need to be like big, huge file sizes, megabytes big. Uh, just a few hundred kilobytes is enough for us to assess. 
Um, it will help you too with the internet, so it's quicker for you to upload. Um, if you're bringing parents, for example, they want to accompany you to visit, um, they can apply. Um, so we are accepting visit applications, but they need to stay in the UK for a minimum of 14 days for that self isolation period. OK, so they can't just accompany you for seven days or something. Um, and they can also apply later on. They don't have to apply at the same time as you. Um, for third country nationals, so say you happen to be in Malaysia um, and you're not normally resident in Malaysia at the time of your application, you can apply for the tier four visa from Malaysia. That's also all right. Um, OK, let, let's go to the next slide, please. So the next slide is what most of you have uh, concerns about. Um, so I want to assure you that a lot of the provisions for uh, your tier four visa are being um, taken to consider that we're making it easier for you to apply and when to apply also. So this year um, at present we are opening up the KL Visa Application Centre and the one in Sabah. So uh, if you are from Sarawak, you will need to travel to one of those centres um, at this time. Uh, what's great is that uh, we will uh, be issuing 90 day validities on your initial visa sticker. So that's the sticker that you get just the first time. Um, we also give you provisions for say within that 90 days due to unexpected reasons or um, you just uh, uh, choose not to do the course straight away from the UK. You can replace the 90 day validity free of charge until December 2020. Um, when you apply is when you plan on entering the UK within a 90 day period. So you can uh, enter the UK uh, now or even later on if you if you start learning by online learning uh, as soon as the face to face uh, learning is instructed by your university. Um, and if you would like to um, enter the UK, make sure it is before 6th of April 2021 to start your courses. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of uh, issues when uh, you don't check your email and phone because that's the only way that UKVI colleagues will be able to contact you. So make sure that's correct in your visa application. Now I've put some links on the right there for uh, your Malaysia VFS website. So that's when um, you want to know what services they uh, provide. So if they are going to provide priority visa, um, which is the five working day, uh, they should announce it on that website later on. But right now the standard processing time is 15 working days. That's counted from the day you submit application at the back, that's day one. OK, so let's move on to the next one, please. I'm going to talk about um, when you have your visa and passport in hand. Now, why is it 90 days? It's because you will use that only to enter the UK within that 90 day. Now, with your passport, you will also get a letter. Um, now, this letter uh, allows you to, first of all, you can show it at immigration, but also you can um, exchange the letter at the post office or maybe at your institution if they arrange it for what we call a BRP card. Um, it's your biometric residence permit. So um, you don't need to collect it um, when you arrive in the UK straight away. You do need to complete the self isolation period of 14 days first and then um, exchange that to get your BRP. Um, don't lose the BRP card. Uh, please, please don't lose it. If you go away out of the UK, take it with you. Guard it like your passport, because if you lose it for any any reason, you have to um, take the time to make a new application for a new BRP. OK, so let's go to the next. So let's talk about just a little bit more of what to expect um, at the border. Um, so there is no government quarantine uh, that you have to pay for, but you do need to self isolate at a place of your choice 
for the first 14 days. Now, um, say you're going up north to Manchester. Do you need to go straight to Manchester for the airport? You can go through London. That's also all right. As long as you go then straight to your place of choice for the 14 day isolation. So um, you should not really use public transport, but you can use it if there's no other option. But do check on this link I've given you, the border control website. Um, for what the different regulations for the four UK countries are. So it might be slightly differing for England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Um, there's also a public health passenger locator form on that link that you do need to input your journey. So that includes um, your transit points, your final destination, uh, 48 hours before you arrive in the UK. Okay, so next slide, please. So, um, I'm going to talk about something uh, interesting in the next slide with regards to your post study work. To the next slide, please. Thank you. It's loading a little bit. Um, so we're really committed um, to helping students stay in the UK and build the world class experience. So our new graduate route uh, reflects this. So this is going to be introduced in summer 2021. So the new graduate route will be available to international students um, who have completed your degree first, of course, at undergraduate level or above. And you still have a valid tier four visa at the time that um, you apply for this new graduate route. So this implies that it's a separate application. It's not added automatic to your tier four visa. When is it open? Well, you will wait until um, it's introduced in summer 2021 for the actual application to open up. So it's uh, very generously given for two years of period to stay for those studying a bachelor's or master's and a newly introduced three years for those studying their PhDs. Um, you need to apply for it onshore, okay? You still need to be in the UK, you can't return to Malaysia. Um, and this applies to look for work. You don't need a job application ready. You don't need to have secured a job um, by the time you apply. So it's to look for work or work. And um, if you start your application online, sorry, if you start your tuition learning at university online, that's also all right. You can do so and you can do so from Malaysia as well, um, as long as you enter the UK by the 6th of April. Um, OK, next slide, please. So as I say, it's to work or look for work. So by the time you do get work, you will, um, most of you will be getting a new visa, which you can uh, switch into. Most of you will be looking for the tier two general visa, but there are also other opportunities that you can look up. Now, these are just uh, keywords that you can look up on the gov.uk website for the requirements for what the minimum salary threshold is, um, et cetera. So let's uh, move on to the next one, please. We're going to whiz through this because we've got not got much time left. So when you um, uh, are in the UK, you can work for 20 hours maximum. Um, and uh, also you can work for full time. Not, not many people know this if it's during um, your holidays. All right. So check the printing on your visa sticker for how long uh, you get, um, depending on your uh, level of study. All right, next please, the last slide uh, I have for you. It's just a roundup to assure you um, of all the uh, COVID provisions, which means uh, how it is easier for you um, at this time due to COVID. So yes, you can apply um, uh, for your visa later on and start your distance learning first uh, and foremost. You can do that from the UK or from Malaysia. Uh, check with your international office, so have those conversations with them. Um, this also applies if for any reason you are absent, it won't affect negatively your immigration history um, or your sponsor. So just keep on um, registering your absences, that's, that's the only thing to note here. Um, and also, uh, if 
because of COVID, you do need to replace your visa. You don't need to worry. It is still free of charge um, from December until December. I'm sorry. Um, now the last links, uh, I do encourage you to keep, keep, keep on checking because this is uh, where you'll see uh, all the announcements about extensions, uh, where to replace your visa, um, if you can extend in the UK with the, uh, rather than going back to Malaysia for another course, for example. Um, so please keep on checking those two links as well. All right, so uh, I hope that's all been helpful. I'm going to hand it back to British Council and answer more of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pandora, uh, for a very insightful uh, session about Visa. We are quite running out of time, so we we'll only have a few minutes to run through q and I'll hand over to my colleague Isha to moderate the question and answer. Uh, most of the question has been answered in the Q&A box and also during our session, so we we'll only go through uh, a very crucial one, uh, perhaps a reminder. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rifai. Um, yes, uh, um, yes uh, if our, our uh, participants uh, can check the Q&A because uh, I think we have addressed most of the questions over there. Um, so we'll proceed with the uh, question about, uh, I think there are some concerns about um, COVID-19 tests. I know uh, Pandora has mentioned about uh, TB test, but um, some are asking whether we need to take COVID-19 test before departing Malaysia or upon arrival in the UK. So um, perhaps uh, maybe Pandora, would you like to answer this question? Sorry, Pandora, I think you're on mute. Yes, so Pandora, yes, you're on mute. OK, so um, you don't need a COVID uh, certificate to arrive at the border, um, but do check with each individual airline whether that airline or the transit that you're going through might require it. But at the border, you won't need to have a COVID-19 certificate. Thank you, Pandora. Um, Shauki, can we move on to the next slide? Because um, I think that question about parents and family accompanying students have been uh, answered. Um, so we also have a question about uh, uh, visa application, especially if you know A-levels results only coming out in August and most of the university intake um, starts in September. So uh, um, how, what, would, at what advice would you give to the students uh, about visa application and the uh, some maybe reassurance to the students? I'm sorry, there was a little lag uh, in in your question uh, before the reassurance part. Would you mind? Okay, so uh, um, that uh, yeah, um, A levels results are tentatively coming out in August. So what happens if I don't get? Uh, my visa in time for the intake in September. OK, so um, I think uni I, I think universities are being very pragmatic and very flexible with regards to when you do start um, your tuition. So um, I think um, if uh, if for whatever reason you don't get the visa in time, you can start the online learning first from Malaysia and then travel um, uh, to the UK when you get your passport. But um, I don't think it should be a problem uh, if you are uh, urgent, uh, urgently wanting to travel, then do apply as soon as you get the CAS. So the very next day, secure an appointment. OK, thank you. Um, okay, we have a question here from uh, our live session. Um, so I know there is a standard amount of fee that you need to maintain for the visa application because you need to submit a, a bank statement or a proof of uh, enough funding um, to, to apply for the uh, student visa. So um, one uh, audience member is asking us if the amount of maintenance fund for visa application will be reduced because 
of you know um, COVID-19 affecting uh, incomes of the family, and they were used to force that. Uh, they were forced to use that money um, to to continue uh, their expenses. Now, so do do you have any news on on um, those type of changes with the uh, maintenance fund? Um, uh, upon application, uh, you won't need to submit the actual proof um, with your online application, but yes, you do need to prepare the funds available in the bank account in your name. Um, so there is, uh, there has been no change in the amount um, that you will require um, in the immigration rules. So at present, it's still the same amount. But upon submission of the application, you shouldn't and, and you don't need to um, submit the proof online. Okay, thank you, Pandora. Um, Ripan, how are we doing with timing? Because I know um, we've gone past 4.30. Do we have enough time for one more question or two? Yes, let's give a shot for one last question before we wrap up. Okay. Um, uh, I know they are interested about working uh, part time while studying, so maybe we can ask um, Ismat. Um, Hisham has shared his experience about working part time, but uh, since you're a current student, uh, perhaps you can share your experience or observations. I think Ismat just goes offline. Uh, yeah. Okay, no worries. Hmm. Other questions, Tisha? Last? Hmm. Let me see. Because I, I think quite a lot of the questions have already been asked. So I'm trying to find something uh, unique to ask. Uh, okay, so maybe back to Pandora last one. Um, so you mentioned that the vignette, the visa vignette is about 30 or 90 days. So um, do the applicants get to choose 30 or 90 days or is it by default 30 days? Okay, good question. So at present and until further notice, um, we will issue 90 days for every new tier 4 applicant. Now I know some students have applied in the past, perhaps in the spring, um, they have gotten 30 days but weren't able to travel due to COVID um, so then deferred or something. Um, those students can replace the vignette and then get the 90 days. But at present, until further notice for all new students, you will be getting 90 days. Okay, thank you. So I think Rifan, um, that's all the questions we have for today's session. Thank you, Cha. Thank you so much. Um, we are slightly above the time, hence I will need to wrap up and this is all that we have for today. And we will have to bring this discussion to a close. On behalf of the British Council um, the, and all listeners, I'd like to thank our panelists for their valuable contribution. Uh, we hope that you have found today's webinar useful and informative. We'll be sharing a recording of today's webinar session to everyone who registered for the event. If you have any uh, questions following today's session, please feel free to contact the British Council at studyuk.malaysia at britishcouncil.org. Um, so a final thanks to our panelists and all attendees for your questions and contributions and wishing you all the best uh, for uh, with your studies. Thank you. <laughs>